Okay, good. Good morning. So that's actually a, it's a useful introduction because you've got decisions to make and I, I want to talk about decision making. So what I'd like to do is talk about sort of two ongoing projects um, in the lab at the moment and they sort of develop on some of the themes that I talked about um, over the last couple of days. Um, so I, I've talked a lot about um, sort of pattern formation and role of morphogens. I'm going to return to that in the second half of what I want to say. But I want to start off by talking about um, this idea of developmental decision making and differentiation. So how does a, uh, a progenitor cell, how does that cell decide to become one or other um, differentiated progeny? And you've already had an example of that from CAT a couple of days ago with the ICM deciding to be either epiblast or, or primitive um, endoderm. So how do cells make decisions and how do you coordinate that to, to uh, form functioning tissues? And, and this work is, of course, inspired by the uh, great American philosopher Yogi Berra, who made this comment. So how do cells take it? So, okay, so to, as a way of introduction, so we got into this because of our interest in the spinal cord. And so I just need to give you a little bit of uh, background on neural induction and then uh, talk about the work that we've been doing. So this actually leads on from what Kat was telling you this morning. So the, what gastrulation does is generate three germ layers, as, as, as you've been hearing about. So endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm, each of which generates distinct um, cell types, distinct <coughs> tissues. And the central nervous system is generally considered to be a product of the ectodermal germ layer. So if you look in your sort of favorite developmental biology textbook, there's, there'll be some diagram along, along these lines. The idea that uh, the epiblast through the process gas relation generates those three germ layers, mesoderm, ectoderm, and endoderm. And uh, the central nervous system neural tissue is a derivative of the ectodermal germ layer. So this idea um, has been exploited uh, to derive, to, to generate, to produce um, methods for the directed differentiation of embryonic stem cells to neural tissue. So taking this idea of um, that the central nervous system is a uh, derivative of the ectoderm, and many groups, so here I'm highlighting the work of Austin Smith from Cam uh, Cambridge University in the UK. Many people over the last 10, 15 years have uh, developed methods to take ES cells, uh, take them out of pluripotency conditions, and then culture them in defined media, defined conditions, which results in the induction of uh, neural progenitors, so cells which have the molecular identity of neural progenitors. So in this uh, particular protocol developed by Austin's lab, you remove um, the fairly complex pluripotency media and allow those cells to grow in fairly minimal conditions. And over the period of three days, from removal of pluripotency conditions, um, the cells induce molecular markers such as SOX1, which is characteristic of, of the nervous system. Now, it's well established that in these differentiation conditions, the regional identity of the neural progenitors you generate is anterior, so it's cortical forebrain in identity. And that also fits with the prevailing view of um, neural induction. So the idea, which again goes back um, to uh, the mid-20th century and uh, uh, well-known embryologists, well-known developmental biologists such as Peter Newcoop, is the idea that the initial neural tissue you generate in the embryo is anterior uh, forebrain in identity, and then additional signals result in the posteriorization of portions of that tissue to generate um, the rest of the nervous system. And this, this mechanism is uh, commonly termed, after Peter Newcoop's work, as the activation transformation hypothesis. The idea that if 
initially you activate a neural identity and then you transform that neural identity to particular regions of, of the nervous system. And uh, signals which can perform this transformation, this posteriorization, have been identified. And a common one which is often used in in vitro differentiations is retinoic acid. So retinoic acid uh, being produced by the body is uh, thought to, is proposed to posteriorize the anterior forebrain neural tissue to more posterior identities. So again, this has been exploited in those in vitro differentiation protocols. Um, and indeed, this does work. So this is some work from Mina Guti when she was in my lab um, developing this. So we took Austin Smith's um, uh, protocol, um, which is involves letting the cells uh, differentiate for three days, um, and then we can either can, can, uh, let them to continue to differentiate or add retinoic acid. So if we assay them at five days in the absence of retinoic acid, and we look at markers that allow us to identify different regions of the nervous system, in the absence of retinoic acid, they express things like OTX2 and a bunch of other genes which are normally seen in the most anterior portion of the central nervous system. If she added retinoic acid at day three, this transformation signal, this posteriorizing signal, assay at day five, then retinoic acid will inhibit those anterior markers. And instead, we'll get more posterior markers, so markers such as the efferins, HOXB2, um, uh, HOXB1, um, which are characteristic of more posterior regions of the nervous system, specifically characteristic of the midbrain and hindbrain. However, what we found frustrating, because we're interested in the spinal cord, is that we were never able to generate cells with the molecular characteristics of the spinal cord. So if we look at uh, particularly the posterior Hox genes, which are characteristic of the trunk and more posterior regions, then we never saw uh, retinoic acid being able to induce those uh, molecular markers uh, within in this protocol. So it's frustrating for us because we're interested in the spinal cord. Also, the spinal cord is quite a lot of the central nervous system, so we really wanted to understand what was going on here. Which is the of the yeah, so that, that was the idea here of um, adding, so this is actually uh, from no to 100 nanomotor. I don't remember exactly the concentrations we've used here. So that's exactly the idea. Is Right, and we haven't, yeah, and we haven't looked into this in great detail, and the reasons for this is I will just about to explain. Okay, so the fact that we're not generating the most posterior spinal regions of, of the nervous system made us wonder, you know, is, so made us think more carefully about this, the activation transformation hypothesis. So this is well established, this is the prevailing view in the field, but of course it's a simplification. And it's sort of known to be a simplification, but is, is, uh, has largely been overlooked, I think. And in fact, this has been known, this, this idea of a single origin of the nervous system has been known to be a simplification for more than a century. So in fact, the first reference I found to this goes back to the late 19th century and um, the Swiss embryologist, Albert von Kerlika. So he, so in this period of developmental biology, there was still sort of mid to late 19th century, there's much debate about whether the germ layer hypothesis um, was valid. And uh, Kerlika was one of the embryologists arguing against um, the idea of a germ layer hypothesis. And one of his arguments is actually laid out in um, uh, this paragraph referring to this figure, which is in his sort of collected works, this book of his collected works. So I'm afraid it's in... Um, 19th century German, but this is uh, my attempt at uh, translating that. And he's referring to this figure here, which is a um, you know, beautiful hand-drawn diagram of the uh, posterior region, the tail bug region of uh, uh, an embryo. And he says, quite strikingly, he says, in a sense, a part of the nervous system is derived from the mesoderm. The spinal cord uh, away from 
uh, after it's been created, is a closed tube away from the posterior end, but it merges uh, with the somites and notochord and ectoderm at the posterior end in a cell mass which is primarily of the middle germinal layer. So here he's making an argument that the spinal cord is actually a product of the mesoderm, not of the ectoderm. So this really contradicts that, this currently prevailing view. So that was back in uh, the late 1800s. Um, he wasn't the last person to work on this, and there has been some subsequent work over the, the, uh, the next century or so. But I just want to highlight um, uh, the work of uh, Valerie Wilson in Edinburgh, who has really um, uh, looked at this in much more detail using more modern techniques and uh, uh, finds really strong evidence for what von Kolleke was um, arguing. So in several, in a series of papers in uh, the early 2000s, she's demonstrated so by doing transplantation, so taking little regions of the tail bud from uh, GFP expressing embryos, transplanting them into uh, non-marked embryos, and then looking at the progeny, looking where the GFP cells end up. She's found evidence that those transplants from that tail bud will indeed contribute to both the spinal cord and the mesoderm, as uh, von Kolleke was arguing. Moreover, in lineage analysis done uh, between Val Wilson and Jean-François Nicolai in Paris, so marking individual cells uh, in the early embryo and then looking at the progeny of the daughter cells of those uh, much later, what they found is a group of clones that uh, contribute to both spinal cord and mesoderm and no other tissues, and those tended to be relatively small clones, suggesting that the, uh, the originator of these clones, the, the cell that gave rise to these daughters, was a bipotential progenitor which went on to produce progeny that uh, contributed to both those, um, those tissues. So these type of data and you know, more, support, more supportive data as well leads to a revision of that simple uh, lineage uh, relationship, which in fact splits the nervous system into two lineages. So the anterior nervous system comprising the brain, so forebrain, hindbrain, midbrain, um, does indeed derive from epiblast ectodermal tissue. By contrast, the cells which contribute to the spinal cord appears to have a, uh, a, more, uh, a more recent, a more common uh, uh, progenitor that is shared with prax and mesodermal cells. And I'm going to call this a neuromesodermal progenitor um, um, after the evidence from Val Wilson that, in fact, individual cells can give rise to both neural and mesodermal tissue. So this suggests a revision to that sort of simple um, uh, lineage relationship uh, that you'll see in most developmental biology textbooks. So we wondered whether this was also uh, the reason why we were unable to make spinal cord progenitors from ES cells. And we thought about, you know, what, where would this cell be in the embryo and, and what would this cell be um, uh, doing? So if you think about the, the results I've showed you so far, this bipotential progenitor would be located in the tail bud of an elongating embryo. So this is a diagram of an embryo about E8. So that's sort of at the, the later time point you saw from Katz's movie of um, a, a developing embryo. So at that time, the tail bud is beginning to, or the, the posterior of the embryo is elongating posteriorly. And the NMP cells, the neuromesodermal progenitors, would be located in that most posterior region of the embryo, behind posterior to where uh, spinal cord, mesoderm, other tissues are, are differentiating. And that region of the embryo is exposed to Wnt and FGF signaling. So if we look more detail in this, and this is a review from... Uh, uh, Dominguez Enrique and uh, Kate Story. If you look in an actual uh, embryo, I think this is a similar, yeah, this is just slightly older, E8.5. If you look in that posterior region of the embryo, so now this is posterior, the head would be somewhere up here, uh, and this is marked with two transcription factors. So in green is SOX2, which is expressed in neural progenitors, 
and in red is the transcription factor brachiuri, which is expressed in um, mesoderm, and is normally considered to be the master regulator of mesoderm induction. So if you, these are cross-sections at various positions along this. So if you look away from the, pos, the very posterior end of the embryo, you can see SOX2 in the forming neural uh, tube, and brachiuri here is in the notochord, so which is a mesoderm der derivative. If you look uh, more posterior to that, behind the node, then you can see a region of tissue where you see cells co-expressing both SOX2 and brachiuri. So if you look at cross-sections through here, you can find individual cells which, uh, which are expressing both the neural marker SOX2 and the mesoderm marker brachiuri, which would be sort of a molecular correlate, would be consistent with this idea that cells have a bipotentiality. So they have some kind of um, superposition of both uh, neural and mesodermal identity. Okay, and this is the region here which is being exposed to Wnt and FGF signaling. And crucially, those cells are exposed to Wnt and FGF signaling before they've entered into either neural or mesodermal tissue. So, Mina wanted to ask whether we could exploit that. If we mimic that in vitro, could we actually generate neuromesodermal progenitors and then a spinal cord? So that... Seeing what was going on in the embryo then allowed us to um, tweak, to change what we were uh, doing in the, the in vitro differentiation. So in the normal differentiation, not neural differentiation, you release cells from pluripotency conditions and allow them to differentiate for three days. And it's that three-day time point when uh, neural markers begin to be expressed. So what we ended up finding is that if we expose cells to a pulse of wind signaling between day two and day three, so prior to those cells adopting uh, a neural identity, and if we assayed at that day three time point, in contrast to the controls which express SOX2, the neural marker, after the 24-hour exposure to wind signaling, we see these differentiating cells co-expressing SOX2 and brachiuri very similar to those cells we're seeing in the embryo. So that looks like they may be uh, neuromesodermal progenitors. If we allow those cells to then differentiate further in vitro, so we remove wind signaling at day three, and then uh, allow those cells to differentiate for two additional days, either in the presence of retinoic acid or in the absence of retinoic acid, in fact. Brachiuri isn't maintained, so brachiuri is transiently expressed and then downregulated. However, SOX2 is consolidated, and then if we look at the progeny of those cells we, with a range of molecular markers, we find evidence of differentiation into neural tissue and indeed into neurons. And when we look at regional identity, we find uh, molecular markers characteristic of the spinal cord. So, for example, HOXC9 is expressed in the trunk, the thoracic region, so it, between forelimb and hind limbs, and you can see... Uh, many of those progenitors expressing HOXC9 in those conditions. So that's consistent with this idea then. So uh, if we take uh, ES cells uh, and allow them, uh, pulse them briefly with wind signaling, then allow them to differentiate into neural cells, they become spinal cord, uh, uh, ide spinal cord regional identity. So are they really going through this bipotential state? So can we also direct them to become mesodermal? Sir, all progenitors are bipotential. Sorry? All progenitors are bipotential. Uh, bipo uh, bipo Is all... All progenitors are Are all of these progenitor cells bipotential cells? Is it different to two cells? Not necessarily two cells. It could be... So I'm not saying they're doing uh, an asymmetric division, they just have the potential to become bipotentiality. So they have the potential to become either neural or mesodermal. And I'm just about to show you that these cells we can also direct to mesodermal. So yeah, so can, so at day three, remember they're co-expressing SOX2 and brachiuri, so can we also direct them to, to mesoderm? Uh, and the answer is yes, we can. And we can if, instead of removing wind signaling at day three, we continue exposure 
for wind signaling from day three to day five. And now in those conditions, we're calling meso conditions, then instead of upregulation of neural transcription factors such as the SOX family, those are downregulated, and instead we see the upregulation of a set of markers characteristic of uh, the praxial mesoderm, sort of mesoderm that which will go on to form the somites. So most notably, the T-box transcription factor, TBX6, which is expressed through that uh, region of the embryo you saw uh, Andy looking at yesterday, so the uh, pre-Semitic mesoderm, is expressed by the majority of cells exposed to wind signaling at day five. And then if we allow those cells to continue to differentiate in vitro, we again see molecular markers characteristic of cells which are normally derived from the somites. So desmin and myoD expressing cells, which is um, a characteristic of, of, of uh, muscle, skeletal muscle cells. In your first lecture, you spoke about the importance of knowing the time scales on which like, your teacher developed. Yeah. Could you comment on how important it is to be discreet over the right time scale and if it don't match the one of development? Yeah. So, and I, this will, yes, I can. So, this. So this pulse of wind signaling, it has to be prior to day three, which is the time point at which you see SOX1 come on, which is sort of generally our marker for neural cells. So those cells are competent to become NMPs prior to day, day three when they, they're committed to neural. Uh, but you also can't add wind too early. And our interpretation of this, again based on molecular markers, is that mouse ES cells um, look molecularly closest to ICM cells that Kat was talking about. And over this period of uh, one or two days, they lose some of the ICM character and adopt an epiblast-like identity. Again, this is based on molecular markers. Um, specifically, by day two, by between day one and day two, those cells are expressing FGF5 which is normally considered an, an epiblast marker and distinguishes from the ICM. So we think the key aspect is that you're exposing epiblast-like cells to wind signaling, and that's key for this posteriorization. And again, if you think about where those cells are located in the embryo, that's in a region that Val and others refer to as a caudal lateral epiblast. So those, it's epiblast. So what we think we're doing here is... Um, as closely as we can, recapitulating the normal signals that the embry those embryonic cells would be exposed to. Okay, and then finally, just we can also transplant these cells. So at day three, we can transplant them back into, so this is mouse ES cells, back into chick embryos, and they will contribute to both spinal cord and uh, somites. So that's consistent with this idea then. So we can in vitro now recapitulate the uh, aspects of the development of the spinal cord, convert ES cells to neuromesodermal progenitors, which we can then direct either to mesoderm or to spinal cord progenitors. So this, so far, I've just talked about mouse ES cells. We can use the same principles, and this is being done in collaboration with Anessa Stacharidis in Val Wilson's lab. We can um, adopt the same principles to convert human ES cells to uh, NMPs and then to uh, progeny of NMPs. And again, this comes back to the question about the timing. So human ES cells um, appear to be a, a different embryonic stage from mouse ES cells, so they're more similar to epiblast uh, rather than ICM. And what we found is that that we had to change the timing of the addition of signals um, to account for the, the different, the slightly more mature uh, identity of human ES cells. But with that change, then we can generate cells, uh, human uh, neuromesodermal progenitors with many of the same molecular markers as, as mouse uh, NMPs. And I think this is interesting from a, as a developmental biologist because these kind of approaches, for the first time, allow us to think about doing human developmental biology, so we can start to recapitulate aspects of human development in vitro. The other point I wanted to make is, is sort of the evolutionary point. 
So if we think about this population of neuromesodermal progenitors in vertebrate embryos, they're located at the posterior tail region of, of the embryo, and they contribute progeny that generates both neural and mesodermal tissue under the influence of wind signaling and um, through transcription factors such as CDX cordal, which you'll hear about in a moment. If you think about other bilaterians, so you, not Drosophila because Drosophila is weird, but if you think about um, all other, most other bilaterians, then there's a very similar mechanism which generates the trunk of almost all bilaterians. So a population of cells at the posterior end of the growing embryo, referred to as a growth zone in insects, in, in short germ band insects, also contribute cells to neural and mesodermal tissue under the influence of the same signals, under the influence of wingless signaling. And indeed, that region of the embryo expresses the same set of uh, transcription factors, the caudal. So this really, this population of cells, this mechanism is probably ancestral to bilaterians. And Drosophila is unusual in being a long germ band insect, insect in which the whole uh, AP axis, axis is generated simultaneously rather than being uh, sequentially uh, laid down by axis elongation. So wind signaling, wingless signaling is well established as a posteriorizing factor. So it's so the history of molecular embryology identified wingless. And I should say this is a nice review from David Kimmelman on this, talking about wind signaling and posteriorization. So wind and wingless signaling is associated with posterior regions of um, not only bilaterians, I think it goes even in Niderians as well. You can see evidence of uh, so it's a very ancestral, very evolutionary, uh, deep uh, uh, relationship between wingless signaling and the posterior of the embryo. Yeah, so I come, I come back and talk about retinoic acid. So retinoic acid is, is so that's much more um, a vertebrate innovation as far as I'm aware. So certainly Drosophila, you don't see retinoic acid. There's, who's working on planarians? I don't think there's any evidence for... Is there any evidence of retinoic acid signaling in planarians? Does anyone know? Not that I'm aware of. Okay, so where have we got to? So we're now... We can return back to this decision-making question, right? So we've now uh, managed to establish an in vitro system where we can generate a bipotential uh, cell type which we can direct into either the two uh, progeny, either into spinal cord or mesodermal uh, cell types. And indeed, we can find conditions in vitro where we generate a mixture of those two cell types, so uh, proportions of both neural and mesodermal cells uh, simultaneously. And those will actually go on to differentiate into uh, neurons which really want to uh, synapse onto the, the muscle-like cells that are, are developing in vitro. So we thought this was a good system to try and ask what is the underlying mechanism that allows cells to decide between uh, two alternative fates. And we've taken several approaches to this. So the one I want to talk about today starts with some um, analysis of single cell transcriptome um, data from, from these. So again, this is in collaboration with Val Wilson's lab, and we've uh, We've done this from both in vivo and in vitro cells. I'm just going to talk about the in vitro data today. And I know next week you're going to have uh, more single cell um, data, more single cell technology talks from Alan Klein. So this will just be sort of a brief warm-up for that. So, so the data I'm going to talk about comes from in vitro. So we've differentiated cells in vitro in conditions that give us as mixture of NMPs, neural and mesodermal cells. And then we dissociate uh, those into single cells. And then we're using um, a particular technology, uh, a microfluidics technology, which allows us to manipulate those cells um, into micro wells in which we can then perform um, uh, reverse transcriptase and, and 
uh, library synthesis, and this is the fluidine C1 system. So we can convert single cells into uh, cDNA libraries and then sequence those cDNA libraries and then align those to the genome, normalize them, um, clean up the data, so remove debris, remove um, occasions where we have multiple cells, and then analyze the data. So if you just if you go through this pipeline, you end up with transcriptomes for each of the cells you've sequenced. And then we can do things such as cluster that data. So here we're looking, so each column represents a single cell, and each of the rows represents a particular gene. So we have, uh, I think in this data set there's 100 or 150 cells, um, in which clustering, so this is a hierarchical clustering, you can readily see that we've got uh, several quite um, distinct cell types within, um, within this population. And indeed, if we look at the gene expression signature for each of those cells, we can begin to identify what those cell types are. So for example, I know that this pink cluster represents neural progenitors within the population because we can look, in, look at the transcriptome and see the expression of, of neural genes. OK. So from the transcriptome data, we can, uh, we can recover uh, the identity of individual cells. But what we really wanted to do is ask whether we could reconstruct uh, differentiation pathways, so the uh, trajectories that take you from NMP to either neural or mesodermal cells. So to do that, we've uh, adapted um, uh, some, some graph theory approaches that have uh, started to be uh, commonly used in, in, in this field. And this is based on Cole Trapman, Trapnell's uh, work um, from a couple of years ago. And let me give you intuition here. So each of those cells is now represented by its transcriptome. So you can think of that as a very long vector uh, of gene expression uh, uh, levels. So what we want to do is, so each of those cells is then a, a point in high dimensional space, each of those dimensions being a gene, a gene. And so the idea is that the differentiation route would be, or you would link cells to their nearest neighbors in that high dimensional space. So if you're close in uh, high dimensional space, you're related to one another. And then what you want to do is find trajectories, so minimum spanning trees from that very high dimensional graph, with the idea that um, that, uh, that minimum spanning tree, those minimum spanning trees would represent average differentiation routes um, through that gene expression space. How is that? Did that make sense? Yes. So, are you doing the phylogeny uh, without having temporal information? Like there's no temporal information. There doesn't have to be any temporal information at all. You're just assuming there's asynchrony within the population. So, you're recovering cells which are, just happen to be uh, close to each other in, in that temporal dimension. And you're trying to recover that, um, those relationships. Yeah. Yes. So let, let's try. OK. So the idea is what we want to do. So each of these points represents a cell. And they're connected by, uh, because they're close to each other in that high dimensional space. And then this has been projected down into two dimensions. So let's try again. So here's, here's the actual pipeline that uh, Julian in the lab developed. So we have the transcriptomes of all of those uh, cells. So what he does first is just to pick. Um, genes which have high variance. So we're not interested in genes which are constant across all of those cells. We're just taking the, um, the most dispersed genes with the idea that that would give us information about the differences uh, uh, during differentiation. And then we're measuring, he's measuring the, the um, distance between each pair of cells with a Euclidean distance based on the dispersed set of genes we're looking at. So then we have um, a, matri a matrix with um, Euclidean distance, pairwise Euclidean distance, in which we want, re want to reconstruct uh, a, a graph from that. So one of the problems, of course, 
when you think about this in high dimensional space particularly and the technical noise which comes from um, inevitably from single cell transcriptome is that it's very, it could be very sensitive to uh, noise. So just a small change in position of uh, an individual cell within that high dimensional space could lead to a very different graph. So to try and deal with that, uh, he's taken sort of a bootstrapping approach where he's building multiple minimum spanning trees but using uh, only 80% of the data in each of those spanning trees. So you build thousands of minimum spanning trees from different uh, selections of 80%, and then you look at what you look at the edges which are commonly used, and you just keep those, and edges that are infrequently used, uh, you eliminate. So from that, you end up with a graph of connected cells, and you can see minimum uh, spanning trees through that uh, space. Yeah. Okay, so what does a color mean? So here, this is a set, this one here. This is um, some distance measure. So I suspect, but I, I suspect that yellow means close and blue means far away, but I don't, this is really just for illustrative purposes. Yeah, so, yeah, we, I should sort this out, shouldn't I? So I think in here what he's illustrating, yeah, I do know. In here what he's illustrating is the red um, points here are the 20% of connections that he's not allowing to be used. So you're using just 80% of the data in each of these cases to build a minimum spanning tree. And then each of the minimum spanning trees that you've generated, you compress all of those matrices into one matrix and you just keep the edges which are used in many of the spanning trees. So it's a bootstrapping way of trying to deal with sensitivity to, to noise. Sorry? So it's the connectivity, mean, it's a minimum spanning tree. So what we're trying to do is to make a connected graph with the minimum number of edges. So, or the minimum length of edges. Exactly, yeah. Uh, well, what we actually want to do is, is so what we're, what we're assuming is that within this differentiation, you have cells at every position along this differentiation. So both cells which are still in a, you know, an NMP-like state as well as cells which are going towards metaderm or going towards neural. Yeah, and again, we can look at the, the overall transcriptome of each, cells, of each of the cells and determine how many large clusters there are and whether there are outliers within the, the population. Also, there's uh, cells, cells which are before uh, the Yes, yes. In fact, you'll see that when I show you, actually. Okay, so when we've done that, right, so we started off with this population of single cells, and then this is the graph we end up with. And again, I've colored, so each of these points represents a cell, and this graph is based on that minimum spanning tree reconstruction. And I've colored these cells on the basis of the clustering here. So what you can see is that the clusters are close together in this graph, so that, that makes sense, right? That's what we want to achieve. Um, in addition, what you can see is that there's obviously sort of two kind of branches uh, to this graph, and I've already labeled um, the different populations here, and I can label them because each of these cells, we know the transcriptome, and we can look at the uh, 
gene expression in each of those cells, and based on the markers we were familiar with, we can identify those populations. So, for example, so just in more detail then, um, if we look at the expression of this set of transcription factors, so remember that SOX2 is expressed in NMPs and in neural cells. Brachyuri is expressed in NMPs and mesodermal cells. So you can see this population of cells here is co-expressing both SOX2 and brachyuri. Along this branch here, you see decreasing levels of SOX2, but brachyuri is maintained, and you see the upregulation of TBX6, and TBX6 is that marker for paraxial mesoderm. By contrast, if we look along this branch here, you see a downregulation of brachyuri, an upregulation of SOX1, and SOX1 is a marker for neural progenitors. So that suggests that this, uh, so that this graph technique has appeared to reconstruct the trajectories from NMP to neural and mesodermal. And now, since we have the complete transcriptomes of each of those cells, we can look at the average changes in gene expression along each of those routes. Does that make sense? So, okay, if we do that then, so we're just looking from, so if we go from NMP to neural, we're looking at the average level of expression of genes uh, from NMP to neural uh, along that trajectory. So if we look at a broader range of genes here, so in the NMPs we see brachyuria and SOX2 expression, also another transcription factor known to be expressed in NMPs, NKX1.2, and they're called all the CDX family of transcription factors. And then as you differentiate towards neural, you see the upregulation of things like SOX1, Iroquois 362, downregulation of brachyuri and the CDX family members. By contrast, if we look along this trajectory from NMP to mesoderm. Again, we're starting in the same position, so we see brachyuri SOX2 co-expression. As we move towards mesodermal cells, we see the downregulation uh, of SOX2 and upregulation of things like TBX6 and mesogenin, again, characteristic of the mesoderm. So from the single-cell transcriptome data, we can begin to infer these differentiation trajectories which also suggest regulatory relationships. So, you know, so it's quite noticeable that you're beginning to see anti-correlation between uh, some of these uh, transcription factors. So we wanted to ask whether we could use these data to go one step further and reconstruct the transcriptional network which produces this bifurcation, produces this decision. Um, but to do that, we wanted to not only use this correlative data, but to, to perform perturbations to really test um, the, the potential genetic interactions. And I want to use the next couple of slides to highlight why I think uh, performing this in ES cells, directed differentiation of ES cells, has uh, certain advantages, um, advantages over uh, doing this in whole embryos. And first of all, to illustrate that, I'm going to take the example of the CDX family of transcription factors. So there are three CDX uh, transcription factors uh, in, in mammals. Um, uh, they're all expressed, as you saw, in the posterior of the embryo in NMPs. And they've, they've been implicated in, in the generation of, um, of the trunk of the embryo. But this is, this is quite technically challenging work to do. First of all, there's three genes which you have to knock all three of them out of mouse embryos, and Jacqueline Deschamps has, uh, has done this. But then the problem is, so you knock out the three CDX genes, and you end up with a truncated embryo. So the embryo forms the first five or six somites, and then there's no more tissue. So it clearly says that CDX is required for axis elongation for the generation of mesoderm and spinal cord. But because you've got no tissue, it doesn't give you much more insight into the molecular mechanism. So the advantage of ES cells and differentiating ES cells in vitro is that you're not reliant on the rest of the embryo in order to analyze, uh, the, analyze what the, their function is. So we've done this with the CDX uh, 
gene, so we can make ES cells using CRISPR that lack all three CDX genes, and then use those in vitro differentiation protocols to convert those CDX null cells into either neural or mesodermal cell types. So here, uh, what I'm showing is either wild type or CDX null ES cells differentiated using the mesodermal differentiation protocol, and then assayed for neural markers. So because we're differentiating to mesodermal tissue, wild type cells don't generate neural, so not expressing uh, neural markers. By contrast, however, in the absence of CDX, these cells now uh, adopt a neural identity. So that suggests that CDX proteins, the CDX genes, are required for mesodermal induction. So not only are they required to maintain axis elongation, but they're actually, in addition, required for the specification of mesodermal tissue. The other thing that you can do in vitro is um, much more easily than you can do in vivo is manipulate the extrinsic signaling conditions. So I've uh, focused, emphasized the idea that Wnt and FGF is required for the induction of NMPs. But as we've already discussed, retinoic acid is also being produced in the embryo. It's actually being produced in uh, the somites. And there's a question of whether retinoic acid, what role does retinoic acid have, if any, in uh, the generation of NMPs themselves? And again, we can ask that question by manipulating retinoic acid signaling levels in vitro. And so what we found is that if we uh, remove all retinoic acid, so all vitamin A, from the differentiation, then SOX2 is no longer maintained. So if we look at day three, uh, SOX2 is no longer expressed in, in vitro. And instead, you have uh, high levels of brachyuria and actually a more rapid induction of TBX6, suggesting that SOX2, in fact, low levels of SOX2 within the NMPs themselves is required to maintain neural competence, required to maintain SOX2 expression. So if we put that together, then we can begin to start reconstructing a transcriptional network. So I've talked about um, uh, several of these transcription factors, the kind of experiments I've described together with um, existing knowledge from uh, the literature allows us to begin to put this together in a transcriptional network in which wind signaling is promoting uh, mesoderm identity and retinoic acid neural identity. So, so, as I talked about yesterday, the next step we wanted to take is can we look at this, can we start to think about this as a dynamical system? So we've taken the same strategy as with the neural tube, uh, tried to boil down this network to the minimum possible to explain uh, this bifurcation behavior, converted it into a series of uh, three linked differential uh, equations, and then uh, performed another optimization. So asked for parameterizations of this network, which give us back the uh, appropriate behavior, again, by uh, optimizing this to several different uh, targets where we've manipulated either signaling conditions or, or simulated mutant conditions. So it's very similar to what I described yesterday. It's still very much work in progress, but we can, again, recover parameter sets that perform appropriately, and then we can start to look at this behavior in silico. So one thing we've done then is to uh, look at this behavior and assume that there's some level of stochasticity, so introduce some noise into those uh, uh, recovered uh, dynamical systems. Again, looking at the behavior in one of these plots where we're looking at SOX2, brachyuria, and TBX6, and challenging in silico the simulations with different signaling levels, we can start to recover uh, what you can think of as a decoding map in which behavior uh, in response to different levels of wind signaling or retinoic acid signaling in silico. So as you might expect, wind signaling favors mesoderm, retinoic acid signaling, signaling favors uh, neural, and we can begin to see uh, uh, predictions for combinations of neural and mesodermal tissue with different levels of wind and retinoic acid signaling. Uh, 
And remember, that's what we're seeing from the in vitro conditions. And in vitro, now we can manipulate the concentrations of Wnt and retinoic acid signaling and really look at the relationship between uh, the proportions of cell types we're generating in vitro and uh, the proportions of cell types predicted in silico with the ambition that we should be able to constrain uh, the parameters uh, uh, quite considerably. We should be able to get a much better idea of the parameter sets which generate the appropriate decoding map. So I think, so save that question for Alan Klein next week. So he's really an expert in that. So he'll be able to, and I'm sure he will go into some detail about that. Right, because this decoding map you have that mechanic dynamics you showed in the first couple of days. Yeah, so we do have this, sorry, this right. is meant to be the dynamics. Yeah. Right, but instead of doing this approach, which is just a Boolean approach, is dynamics important? I don't know, I mean, I guess that's another way to put it. Is dynamics important to make these state maps? Or you, know, you could have got this thing to learn by I'm not sure I can answer that without thinking about it more. But you haven't tried, I guess. No, no. I mean, so so part of the reason for this is that our actual, well, first of all, we like, it's nice using continuous functions because there's a lot of theory in continuous, yeah. But also, the optimization, actually, we're looking, part of the optimization is for levels of, of so, for example, we know, um, so SOX2 levels are lower uh, at, in the NMP condition than they are at the star condition. So that was part of what we were optimizing. Yeah. So the one trajectory of the uh, dynamic assistant, uh, does it happen without, uh, within one uh, uh, cycle, or the idea is that it goes across the uh, cycle? Uh, we don't know the answer to that. We, we tend to ignore cell cycle. The cells are proliferating during this, and whether there's whether and how cell cycle influences this, we haven't looked at. But, but it is a key thing that happens over the cell cycle, there is an inheritance of uh, the transcriptome. Yes, I mean, there, there, there has to be an inheritance unless there's a mechanism specifically stopping inheritance, right? So the, the default. The, the default assumption would be a, a, a Poisson distribution of transcription factors between daughters unless there's some mechanism to stop that. Yeah. I'd like to just add to that that Yeah, right. So this color, so yeah, so yellow is NMPs, and we're defining NMPs as having uh, moderate levels of SOX2 and above a threshold of brachyuri. The gray are unassigned and they um, represent the, within the simulation cells which don't fall into um, the thresholds we've set to uh, uh, define these different cell types. But this is a kind of, this is very much work in progress and this is refining the simulations on the basis of data that we can generate from these type of experiments is exactly what we need to do. Okay, I'm going to skip that. So, so okay, so we're beginning to get to a point where we have a, um, a transcriptional network that we convert into a dynamical system to explain this behavior. So there's one thing that I didn't mention which I think is interesting as well. So. Um, so retinoic acid is being produced by the somites, which is a mesoderm derivative, and retinoic acid is uh, promoting neural induction. So there's, if you think about this, then there's a, uh, a regulative feedback through this, and we can sort of summarize that if we uh, abstract it down to this kind of network. So mesoderm induction, dependent on wind signaling, induces TBX6, TBX6 expressing cells produce more retinoic acid. Retinoic acid is favoring neural induction. So if you produce too much mesoderm, 
then that will result in more retinoic acid production, which would then favor neural generation. Conversely, if your production of mesoderm decreases, you'll produce less retinoic acid, therefore uh, produce more mesoderm. So this is actually uh, looking at Kat's recent work as well. This sounds very similar to the mechanism generating ICM, uh, from ICM generating epiblast and primitive endoderm. So remember that epiblast is, uh, is producing FGF, and FGF is favoring uh, primitive endoderm. So this is a very similar regulative feedback uh, strategy to that uh, Kant is talking about. So it, pro it provides a way of balancing the generation of two cell types. So if you think about this in the context of axis elongation, you need to be making the right proportions of neural and mesodermal tissue to have uh, the well-regulated elaboration. So if you're producing too much of one tissue, then you, your axis elongation will fail. So this may be, again, a sort of a recurring theme for, uh, in these systems. So a regulative feedback that uh, rebalances the production of cell types if, if they become unbalanced. In, in the model or in, yeah, so um, I, I'm pretty sure we would be able to find that in the model. What I'd like to do is get a more constrained parameter set first, which we feel is better representing the data. Um, it is true, so exactly, that is true. So, in fact, uh, so in some of these conditions, so this will be, yeah, the bifurcation parameters will be Wnt and retinoic acid, in fact, in that, that case, yeah. Okay, so now I want to switch gears. So how are we doing on time? Because I'm... Okay, all right. So I wanted to switch gears now and come back to neural tube patterning. Um, and so I talked a lot about neural tube patterning, and I talked about just this little area down in the ventral neural tube. So now I want to take a slightly different perspective and think about the whole neural tube patterning. So as I introduced to you, neural tube is patterned along this dorsal ventral axis and is patterned by anti-parallel gradients. So we've spoken a lot about hedgehog signaling ventrally, but dorsally BMP signaling is important. And BMP signaling in a mirror image to hedgehog signaling divides the dorsal neural tube into domains of progenitors. So this idea of anti-parallel morphogen gradients is a recurring theme in tissues. So the other common example would be anti-parallel gradients of bicoid and caudal along the AP axis of the uh, Drosophila embryo. So how does this, so how do anti-parallel gradients, if we think about this at sort of the tissue level, uh, what's the strategy for um, patterning with anti-parallel gradients? And one additional complexity, particularly in the case of the neural tube, or particularly in most tissues, big, um, the Drosophila embryo being unusual, in most tissues, this process of patterning is happening as the tissue is growing. So this is just taking uh, some representative images um, across this developmental time window for the neural tube from early to late. So this is about a 48-hour time window. So you can see over this period of time, the neural tube, the patterning axis, uh, grows by three to fourfold over this period of time. So there must be some mechanism that allows the pattern to be elaborated, even as the tissue is changing this uh, markedly in size. So what is, how do anti-parallel morphogen gradients, how do they fit into this? And, and one thing, the starting point for this piece of work was just looking at these images, noticing the growth in the tissue. 
uh, and noticing the gradual elaboration of this pattern, but also looking at these domains and thinking that these domains look uh, consistent. They have sort of a, um, the, the precision of these domains appears to be constant, relatively constant throughout this period of time. So it's not, it doesn't appear that you're starting off very noisy and refining. They always appear to have uh, relatively constant precision. And we can be more quantitative about that. We can actually measure the precision of pattern over time. So this is taking uh, two particular boundaries, so PAX3, which is in the dorsal neural tube, and NKX 6.1 in the ventral neural tube, looking at the precision of the boundary during this period of time we're interested in, and seeing that throughout the whole time, um, the precision of boundary stays constant, stays within about two to three cell diameters. Okay, so now we can ask the question, so how does that level of precision, how is that established? So within the framework of morphogens, we can ask the question of whether those two morphogen gradients, do they have enough information? Is there enough information in that gradient to account for this level of precision across this developmental time window? So we think about the precision of a gradient, then the, so the intuition here is that if I tell you a concentration of morphogen, how accurately can you tell me the position within the tissue? So if the gradient is steep, then you have uh, high precision. So a small change in the concentration will result in a change in position. By contrast, if the slope of the gradient is low or non-existent, then concentration information is not very informative. So uh, a concentration at this, this concentration here could imply any position in, in this region of the tissue. And we can state that uh, formally. Okay, so we wanted to ask what is the positional error, the positional precision provided by the hedgehog and the BMP gradient. And to do that, we don't want to measure the ligands, right? Remember, it's all about the, what's going on in the nucleus, so we wanted to measure um, the signal itself. So to do that, in, for hedgehog signaling, we've taken advantage of the reporter I mentioned yesterday and the day before. So a transcriptional reporter of glee activity, the effector of hedgehog signaling. Whereas dorsally, BMP signaling, we're able to use a, uh, a readout of activated SMAD signaling, so the transcriptional effector of BMP signaling, so phospho-SMAD uh, antibodies. So now this allows us to measure the gradient of um, hedgehog and BMP signaling over time. So first of all, measuring the hedgehog gradient. So, this, so the blue line here represents the glee activity uh, from ventral to dorsal, each of these graphs is uh, early to late. So early developmental time to late developmental time. So hedgehog signaling is active ventrally, so what you see is high levels of hedgehog signaling ventrally, a gradient of uh, glee activity decreasing dorsally, and little if any uh, glee activity in the dorsal neural tube. And what you can see if you look at this is that the uh, effective range of the glee activity, the hedgehog gradient, decreases over time, and that's a consequence of the neural tube increasing in size. So your patterning axis is increasing in size, and consequently your, um, your signaling gradient is being restricted to closer to the source. So with that, those measurements of glee activity, we can then measure the uh, positional precision, so and that's the black line here. So you can see where you've got a steep gradient, you are uh, reasonably precise, so you're precise within about two or three cell diameters, and as the gradient retracts ventrally, you see the region of precision decreases over time. So hedgehog signaling is high precision ventrally, so that's kind of uh, intuitive. Can you hold on to that? Because I am going to hopefully get to some dynamics at the end. Okay. So then we can do 
the converse of this, so looking at the BMP, and we see the opposite, right? So BMP signaling, SMAD activity is high, dorsally decreasing as you move ventrally. Therefore, the precision is high dorsally. The gradient decreases, retracts over time because of the growth of the neural tube. Um, so BMP has high precision dorsally. So we've got these two opposing gradients. So what, how precise would the neural tube, how much information is there if the cells were using a combination of those two gradients? So what's the joint uh, positional precision? So you can calculate that. So if cells are using a combination of both BMP and hedgehog signaling, what you see at these early developmental times, the black line represents the uh, calculated precision. You see at these early developmental times, you have relatively high precision across the whole axis, including the middle. Um, and that precision is about two or three cell diameters across the whole axis. As the neural tube grows and the gradients retract, then you see increasing imprecision implied by the gradients in the middle as, as those cells are no longer exposed to either the BMP or hedgehog signaling. Okay, so that, uh, okay, that makes some predictions or implies several things. So um, if we believe, if we hypothesize that the gradients are providing the necessary precision to explain the uh, sharpness of those boundaries, then um, what is the mechanism by which cells are integrating both BMP and hedgehog signaling? In addition, there must be a mechanism which allows the early precision to be elaborated at later times when the information from those gradients is declining. So first of all, this implies that cells are reading a combination of BMP and hedgehog signaling. And there was already evidence to support that. So actually some work I uh, did just as I was leaving my postdoc um, suggested that. So this is by uh, Carol Lee, a colleague of mine, uh, when I was a postdoc. And what we showed is that, um, so using chick explants, remember these neural plate explants, we can culture ex vivo. In the absence of adding anything, they express markers characteristic of the dorsal neural tube. If we add hedgehog, then we repress dorsal identity and get ventral gene expression induced. If we add a combination, that same level of hedgehog signaling, but add BMP to it, now uh, we repress the ventral identity and instead return to a dorsal identity. So that suggests that cells in some way are able to, or are integrating, doing, receiving both signals, or can respond to both signals simultaneously. Okay, so then if we think about this then, so we've got a patterning axis here of uh, ventral hedgehog gradient, dorsal uh, BMP gradient, so we can now think about this patterning axis as a, a map or a, some kind of uh, signal space in which uh, one of the axes is BMP signaling, the other axis is hedgehog signaling. Now this patterning axis becomes a curve through this signal space. So in the ventral neural tube, you see high levels of hedgehog signaling, low levels of BMP signaling. In the dorsal neural tube, you see high levels of BMP signaling, low levels of hedgehog signaling. And these uh, points along this curve represent equidistant positions along uh, the dorsal ventral axis. So you can think of this as some kind of uh, morphogen signal space in which the patterning axis is a curve through that space. So this, this curve represents the average levels of BMP and hedgehog signaling that a cell would see at each of these positions. But of course, the reality is that uh, because of noise, because of um, uh, you know, the vagaries of development, then in fact, some cells will see uh, levels of signaling that fall outside this curve. So you can imagine that they might see a slightly higher level of BMP signaling compared to hedgehog signaling be outside the curve, or down here they're seeing lower levels of hedgehog signaling compared to uh, BMP signaling. So if, if a cell is exposed to that, uh, those conflicting instructions, 
how do they decide what identity to adopt? So just looking at that, the intuitive thing to do is to figure out what is your shortest distance to the, uh, the patterning axis curve and choose that identity. So you would just uh, figure out how close, how, uh, what's the shortest distance from your conflicting information back onto the patterning curve. And in fact, that represents the statistical equivalent of doing a maximum likelihood estimation. So we can formally state that then. So if your task is to infer position from measured levels of, of hedgehog and BMP, so some uh, level of BMP, some level of hedgehog signaling, if the uh, average observed signaling levels at any position at a particular position x along uh, the patterning axis is um, CB and CS, if we assume that the probability of observing any level of those signals at that position is, is, a Gauss, is Gaussianly dis distributed, so it's a, uh, a, a bivariate normal distribution, then you can write down uh, just a bivariate normal distribution in which, given a position, your probability of observing uh, this con concentration or level CB and level of CS is given by this formula. So the task we want to do is the inverse of that, is given two concentrations, we want to uh, infer X, estimate, give us a maximum likelihood estimation of X. So that's just maximizing the inverse of this. Okay, so we can calculate that given the patterning uh, curve we've observed. And now this predicts the positional identity that would be uh, adopted by a, uh, a cell given any combination of signals to which they're exposed. So we can think of this now as a prediction, right? We've converted the data we've measured of, of uh, hedgehog and BMP levels into a decoding map which represents any combination of BMP and hedgehog signaling. So can we test this prediction? So the way to test this is we want to look at uh, how cells are behaving if they're exposed to uh, concentrations outside of, um, outside of their normal patterning axis. And for the sake of time, I'm going to skip over the first test and just take you to the second one. Okay, so the first thing was just talking about down here. That, that fulfills the test, but it's maybe not such a stringent test. What was more interesting to us is thinking about this top right-hand corner of the decoding map. So in this region of the decoding map, then there are two predictions. So first of all, if you're exposed to high levels of both BMP and hedgehog signaling, the prediction is that you should lose intermediate positional identities. So you, you won't become an intermediate cell. So it's not like the cells are measuring a ratio of the two signals. The second prediction is that in contrast to most of the decoding map, which gives you uh, unimodal uh, probabilities of cell identities, in this region of the map up here, you begin to see bimodal distributions where there's almost equal probability of becoming either a very ventral or a very dorsal uh, cell type. So this, this provided us two predictions that we could test. And we could test them by taking advantage of this explant assay. So we can explant out this region of uh, neural plate and then essentially recreate an in vitro decoding map where we're controlling the recombinant concentrations of, of those two signals. So what you can see, and then we count the number of cells expressing uh, ventral or dorsal markers. So NKX22 is a high response to hedgehog signaling. You can see it's induced by high concentrations of hedgehog. OLIG2 is induced predominantly by moderate concentrations of hedgehog, whereas PAC7 is a dorsal gene as in, and induced by, um, by uh, BMP signaling. And so from this, we can look across this uh, entire concentration uh, map. And we see in this top right-hand corner now, in contrast to um, uh, low levels of both BMP and hedgehog signaling where we get intermediate identities at this high concentration. When they're exposed to high levels of both signals, they um, 
uh, they, they lose intermediate identities and, in fact, uh, show a bimodal response. And you can see the bimodal response most clearly in individual uh, explants, where here we're looking at uh, cells, at explants exposed to high concentration of BMP and hedgehog signaling, looking at oleg to pac 7 and you see a mixture of cells expressing high-response genes to BMP, PAC7 high-response gene, or moderate-response genes to hedgehog oleg 2 But most of the cells are decisive. They're either red or green. They're, there's a bimodal distribution. Yeah? Yeah, so that's, in fact, so uh, equal... So you've got to think about this in terms of biological units, I guess. I don't think we would compare absolute concentration um, because they're, they're activating different signaling pathways. So if you think about the response of cells in the absence of the other signal, I guess we don't have much here on the BMP. But we've uh, titrated the concentrations of hedgehogs so that in the absence of BMP, it's giving us that ventral graded response. And similarly with the BMP, we're seeing different levels of response. Okay, so these type of data suggest we've got a phenomenological model here. So we can convert the dorsal ventral axis into a, uh, a morphogen space of BMP and hedgehog signaling. And this predicts how cells will respond to um, those two signals. So it's a phenomenological mechanism with sort of essentially saying that cells are doing the equivalent of maximum likelihood estimation. So how do cells do statistics? Yeah, so can we try and... So the, the coding map is based on the measurements at one particular time right. point. We can... So the decoding map will change slightly but not substantially if we take it from any of those early time points where we still have sufficient position information in the center. I, so if you let me talk about the transcriptional network, this may give an answer to come back to a sort of a molecular mechanism that can explain it. So the hypothesis is that it's the transcriptional network that does it. And, okay, so... What's the evidence for this? Again, we're going to take the same kind of route of reconstruct a transcriptional network, uh, turn that into a uh, set of equations, and then look how it behaves. And so in this case, we're looking across uh, the entire dorsal ventral axis. And for, um, for the sake of the model, we're going to look at three transcription factors that allow us to define three regions of the neural tube. So NKX6, which is expressed <coughs> ventrally in the neural tube. DBX, which is expressed in a population, a domain of progenitors in the intermediate neural tube. And MSX, which is expressed dorsally. So there's the type of genetic evidence I introduced yesterday, um, uh, we've also taken advantage of here. So for example, in when we knock out both NKX6 genes, we see that DBX uh, expands ventrally, indicating that NKX6 is a repressor of DBX. So if we take those type of data, we can begin to, we can reconstruct a, a genetic network comprising those three genes, which for simplicity I'm going to call ventral, intermediate, and dorsal. There's a series of cross-repressive interactions which should be familiar to you from yesterday between those uh, three transcription factors. And then we hypothesize that um, the ventral and intermediate gene might have input from hedgehog signaling, whereas the dorsal and intermediate gene might have input from BMP signaling. So with this topology, we wanted to find uh, sets of solutions that gave us back the decoding map. So to do this, again, we've taken an optimization uh, approach to it. And so in this case, um, because we wanted to think about the dynamics, in fact, we, our input into this wasn't a single time point. Uh, it was actually the data of the 
uh, gradients through the time course we're looking at. So we're actually using the data itself, slightly idealized, so we fitted exponentials to these, but we're using the data itself over time as the signal input into this. And then the screening criteria we're uh, looking for is to explain the gene expression patterns, to give us um, some of the perturbations I didn't show you, to recapitulate those, and then to give us back the decoding map that we're seeing from experimental data. So again, it's an optimization approach. So there's 13 parameters in the model. Um, we started with, I think, 600 million parameter sets, take it through a series of criteria, and we end up with about 1,000. Uh, from those 600 million parameter sets, we end up with about 1,000 that pass each of the screening criteria. So if we look at those, the 1,000 that uh, pass those criteria, then I think something like over 99% of those, we can smoothly interpolate between those, suggesting they're representing a single, um, single region of parameter space. So we have a set of parameters that pass the screening criteria, and now we can look at how, how they're behaving. So uh, this is just taking three of those parameter sets. These little pinwheels illustrate the values of those 13 parameters. So if we look at the, just the behavior of the gene expression across the dorsal ventral axis, they're giving us the appropriate stripes of gene expression. Um, Moreover, they're giving us the dynamics of gene expression we're seeing from the experimental data. And they're giving us back um, uh, a decoding map that looks very similar to the decoding map we, sh we saw experimentally. With this, particularly looking in the top right-hand corner, this loss of intermediate identities and this acquisition of bimodal distribution. So then with those 1,000 parameter sets which are uh, performing the task, we can ask, what is common between those parameter sets? So can we understand anything about the mechanism if we look at those parameter sets? So there's two sort of key things, two things in common between each of those parameter sets. The first is that all of the cross-repressive interactions between B, I, and D are necessary. So sensitivity analysis suggests that if you, you can only change the cross-repressive parameters a small amount before you break uh, those systems. In addition, if we try an optimization where we uh, forbid one or more of those cross-repressive interactions, we don't recover any parameter sets which pass the screening criteria. So the cross-repressive interactions are necessary. The other thing that is, uh, that is obvious is that while V and D require morphogen input, uh, the intermediate gene either it requires either uh, weak input from the morphogens or no input at all. So the intermediate gene is actually uh, induced by default. So in fact, what happens, and that's, so that requirement for growth is necessary. So in, in the successful models here, what is happening is that initially the morphogens are inducing uh, the V and D genes, but as the gradient retracts, to the poles, then that allows, that decreases the level of signaling in the intermediate, allowing the intermediate gene to be induced, which then has repressive interactions with the V and the D gene. So does this explain that other observation that we have high precision, high positional information early, but later on uh, there's no longer high positional information? So can we explain how you use that position information early, and then maintain it at later times. And again, you won't be surprised given the number of cross-repressive interactions. There's lots of bistability within uh, this network. And indeed, in silico, we can ask, we can uh, remove the signals at particular times and ask whether we can maintain um, the decoding map. So in essence, if we uh, look at the decoding map um, at 60 hours at the end of the run, this is all at 60 hours, if we give them signals up to 60 hours, they have the full decoding map. Even if we uh, remove the signal at 30 hours, we can still maintain that decoding map. Even at 15 hours, it's reasonably good. And it's only, so you only need the signals for the first 15 to 20 hours in order to generate that pattern. 
and then it becomes, um, then it maintains itself through the bistability from the cross-repressive interactions. Okay, we're done. So, this is the summary. So, anti-parallel gradients uh, are patterning the tissue. They appear, the cells appear to be integrating both of those signals, and they're performing the equivalent of a maximum likelihood estimation at their position. We can illustrate that with a, that decoding map that I, I showed you. Um, and we can also, so that's sort of a phenomenological model. We can also recover that with a mechanistic model of a three-node transcriptional network, suggesting a mechanistic explanation for that uh, phenomenological model. And importantly, that that result separates the early gradient decoding from the later uh, maintenance of pattern, suggesting how you can have precise patterns maintained even in, in growing tissues. So what that's suggesting is this sort of two-phase uh, mechanism for establishing pattern. So an initial period of time where anti-parallel gradients are providing position information, establishing positional identity within the neural tube. So that it's at the time when the tissue is smallest, allowing the maximum range of those two signals. Over time, that pattern is, is, is consolidated through the bistability in those toggle switches, and then is elaborated during a subsequent growth phase of the tissue. Final scaling of the tissue you get. I mean, either either you have uniform growth, and that's the way you keep it, or otherwise you're going to change the proportion. Yes. So, do and you have anything to say about that? Yes, I have a lot. I have another talk about that. <laughs> yes. So. <laughs> yeah. So yes, you do. I mean, you can notice that proportions don't stay the same. So, for example, this domain here gets smaller relative to the other domains. Um, this is, in fact somatic motor neuron producing domain, these cells differentiate much more rapidly than other neural progenitors within the tissue. So in fact, this, if, I'm not sure if you want to call it scaling or not, but this, the changes in proportion over time are driven by growth. And the two important parameters for growth is the proliferation rate, which is uh, spatially uniform within the tissue. However, the other important parameter is the rate of post-mitotic differentiation, which removes progenitors from the pool, and that is spatially varying. It's temporally and spatially varying. And it's a combination of spatially uniform proliferation but varying differentiation, which gives you, following the patterning phase, explains the changes in, um, in the proportions of domains over time. No, I mean, in a hand-waving kind of developmental genetics way, we can say we know things about not signaling, but in quantitative terms, no. Okay, so, yeah, the final point is thinking about gap genes and uh, anti-parallel gradients. Maybe something very similar is going on since the overall uh, topology of the gap gene network is, uh, is very similar to um, the neural tube. So let me, so for the last part of this talk, the decoding map section, this is work from Anna Kachiva and uh, Marcin uh, Zagorski, and it's been in collaboration with both Tobias Bollingbach and Kasper Takic at, at the IST. Thank you.